And the biomechanics of spinal column failure is uh, really related to this stress strain curve. Um, the uh, stress means the load that's applied. If I apply a load to my finger, it doesn't take very much of a load for, for, for me to get to A to B. That's the neutral zone. Then when I get out to a point, it takes a lot of stress or a significant load to get it to deform in this B to C range. And this is the elastic zone and defines stiffness. If we're looking at hypermobility, the biomechanical correlate of that is a shifting of this curve to the right or a widening of this neutral zone where the joint or the structure becomes more mobile and more easily deformed over a wider range of motion. Basically, from a biomechanical perspective, a bending moment is the product of the force times the distance. So if I apply a force at a distance d from a center of rotation, uh, the product of this force and this distance creates a bending moment which causes a concentration of stress, in this case ventrally, and initially failure of the spine and of kyphosis. We don't always have to have a bending moment applied, but it takes a greater force to cause <coughs> deformation or failure, as in this case. There's not much difference here at the cervical medullary junction. We're seeing axial loads applied at a distance, for perhaps from a center of rotation, Axial loads uh, coming down, causing some settling and some flexion of the spine because of the axial load and because of the bending moment applied. When we correct deformity or treat deformity, we essentially try to reverse or neutralize this process. We have a variety of means ranging from uh, distraction, three-point bending, compression, and the application of uh, uh, cantilevers, if you will. Um, we're focusing here today at the cervical medullary junction for the most part, although I will address the subaxial cervical spine as well. Um, and we can manage some of these deformities by a variety of fixation techniques and deformity reduction techniques, the head holder during surgery is a good way to attain uh, capital, which is upper cervical flexion and extension, is a very ineffective way of really reducing uh, kyphotic subaxial deformities. It's very difficult to achieve that in the prone position. We can also distract between um, components of the system uh, to achieve a tremendous, uh, to exert a significant amount of force in the spine which uh, can result in um, deformity correction and, um, and distraction and reversal of say basilar invagination. These are deformative stresses and there's really four types. One is true compression as exhibited in A um, the other three are related to one degree or another to B, to distraction of the neural elements um, or stretching of the spinal cord in this case, which can, if in its purest form, can cause injury. Um, and if it's distracted over a ventral component, it can cause a sagittal bowstring effect, as depicted here, and usually a coronal bowstring effect, which all of which result in distortion and disruption and either permanent injury or death or uh, stunning of neural elements. So in the subaxial spine we see the same thing. These are stolen from Fraser. Um, we can see uh, deformative stresses applied to the spinal cord in, in flexion and uh, here we see a number of studies that have looked at this in an anatomical category a demonstration of a stretching of the spinal cord in the flex posture. In flexion in the cervical spine, we tend to see lengthening of the spinal cord, sometimes substantially. Uh, 
Um, with this, we uh, tend to be flexing the spinal cord over a mass, as in the red arrow, which results in compression on this side, but actually distraction on the other side, and we can see stretching of the neural tissue on the opposite side of this uh, compression, uh, resulting in injuries both ventrally and dorsally in this case. So when we deal with, uh, we as surgeons deal with this, we should focus on the deformity. It improves neck pain myelopathy, decreases degenerative changes, uh, improves success both in the short term and the long term. All these folks have uh, subaxial cervical deformities, uh, kyphotic deformities. Most of them are, are post-operative complications. Um, and they all exhibit um, um, one thing, and that is that they have a, a marked trapezius sign. Their muscle is a uh, trapezius muscle, which is a accessory muscle uh, of extension, it is uh, reflexively activated in cases of fixed deformity or in deformities that are related to weakened, for whatever reason, erector spinae muscles. Here's a lady who was fused from occiput to thorax for reasons that were unclear to us, but she was flexed with her head looking down. And I'm gonna finish my talk today with a warning uh, to all of us who operate on these patients to be very careful uh, when we correct deformities at the cervical med medullary junction or actually anywhere in the, in along the spine because what we do at one level clearly affects other levels. But she presents with this horrible neck pain as I alluded to earlier, but she's also got back pain. Why does she have back pain? because in order for her to look forward, she has to lean backwards, and she's loading her spine very extensively um, by uh, the natural posture. I obtain scoliosis views regularly, even in the most mundane of cases, because it's amazing what you can see and how one part affects another. Here we see an upper cervical kyphosis resulting in, in significant hyperlordosis of the low back region. Again, we can use the Mayfield head holder intraoperatively to get capital, obtain capital flexion and extension, and that can be very useful for our deformity corrective procedures. In the subaxial spine, we can apply bending moments, um, like with, uh, with Caspar pins. We can bring the bone to the implant, as depicted here, and correct the deformity and we can use gravity, um, and here is a patient. Um, now we'll, this is, uh, believe it or not, a deformative stress, a manifestation of a deformative stress. At this level of the spine, in this patient with progressive myelopathy and neck pain, uh, multiple ventral and dorsal procedures, she has signal change in her spinal cord in an area where her spinal cord has patent subarachnoid space, ventral and dorsal. So we put her on the table, we had a pillow under her head, we began our release, releasing procedures and applied bending moments and we took the pillow out from beneath her head, allowing gravity to help us correct the deformity. And here we are, post-operatively, and in, in the absence of that repetitive injury, repetitive stretching, repetitive trauma, the signal chain go, change goes away and her myelopathy improves. Here she is pre-op and here she is post-op. Another quick case, a gentleman who'd had a laminectomy 10 years prior for cervical myelopathy improved significantly after his laminectomy and then began deteriorating again. 10 years later, and here he is, and the surgeon is very perplexed as to what is going on. So we obtained flexion on the right and extension x-rays on the left of him, and noticed that over the years, his cervical flexion has been become limited by arthropathies of his facet joints, so he couldn't extend his facet joints significantly. And um, we obtained a flexion MRI with a pr profound um, compression. Um, and I think this would be the, could be the poster child for deformative stress 
from an MRI imaging perspective, comparing neutral and, uh, and uh, flexion MRIs. So we were able to correct him from behind by doing a um, multiple level facetectomies and eliminating that facet arthropathy limitation of extension and correct his deformity as depicted here with immediate improvement over the next several days of, of his myelopathy. All we did was stop the trauma. We stopped the deformative stresses uh, on the spine. There's a paper by Frazier and others, including myself, uh, that uh, outlines some of the theory behind these things that I've been addressing. But again, it fundamentally comes down to B, C, and D um, with stretching and tethering uh, and sagittal and coronal bowstring effect. But surgeon, beware. Um, we can correct these deformities, um, but we must be aware of what we're doing when we do correct these deformities and be cognizant of sagittal balance and the need for the spine to be balanced from top to bottom. And remember this lady, and think about this complex, this problem, and the fact that if we, and it's even worse if we use an occipital cervical fusion, but if we hyperflex the upper cervical spine or the occipital cervical junction, um, we can end up with a hyperlordotic subaxial spine because one segment always affects the next. On the other side of the coin, if we're extending the spine at the cervical medullary junction, um, we may have a very significant adverse effect on the subaxial spine as depicted here and graphically depicted here in this imaging study with the cervical kyphosis occurring after a uh, deformative, a de correction of a deformative stress, if you will, um, at the cervical medullary junction. So the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature uh, 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 treats the disease. Thank you very much. Okay, so, yeah, question. Just a, a comment that um, uh, Breed's work has uh, become part of the foundation of a lot of modern physical therapy. And um, in working with some of the physical therapists we, we deal with, they often talk about either adverse neural tension, which is a, a, a strain uh, that is below the threshold of detection by nerve conduction in EMG type of studies. But that is the most common thing they see. The other term that's used for it is neurodynamic dysfunction, or neurodynamics, talking about the, the uh, more the peripheral nerve and the um, uh, the spine needing to be able to move and glide to accommodate movement. Uh, and so that's another area of literature that might be brought into this group's discussion. Uh, it seems entirely consistent with the concepts that you enunciate. Okay. That makes sense. I, you know, we, we need to draw in those people. I don't know who they are, though. <laughs>